हेलो एवरीबॉडी वेलकम टू आवर यूट्यूब चैनल जय श्री जवाजी नेम ऑफ द बुक बाउंड्रीज वेन टू से यस हाउ टू से नो टू टेक कंट्रोल ऑफ योर लाइफ ऑथर्स डॉक्टर हैंनरी क्लाउड एंड डॉक्टर जॉन टाउन सेंट पार्ट वन वॉट आर बाउंड्रीज यूनिट एट बाउंड्रीज एंड योर फ्रेंड्स कंटिन्यूस Conflict 4 Compliant versus non-responsive Remember the Masha Tammy friendship at the beginning of this chapter one friend doing all the work and the other coasting illustrates the compliant versus non-responsive com- conflict one party feels frustrated and resentful the other wonders what the problem is Masha sensed that the friendship wasn't as important to Tammy as it was to her. Let's analyze the situation. Question number 1. What are the symptoms? Masha feels depressed, resentful and unimportant. Tammy, however, may feel guilty or overwhelmed by her friend's needs and demands. Question number 2. What are the roots? Masha always feared that if she did not control her important attachments by doing all the work she would be abandoned so she became a martha to everyone else mary a worker instead of a lover tammy has never had to work hard for friendships always popular and in demand she has passively taken from important friendships she has never lost anyone by not being responsive in fact they work harder to keep her around question number 3 what is a boundary conflict there could be two boundary conflicts here first masha take, takes on too much responsibility for the friendship she is not letting her friend bear her own load second tammy doesn't take enough responsibility for the friendship She knows that Masha will come up with activities from which she can pick and choose. Why work when someone else will? Question number 4. Who needs to take ownership? Masha needs to take responsibility for making it too easy for Tammy to do nothing. She sees that her attempts to plan, call and do all the work are disguised attempts to control love. Question number 5. what do they need both women need support from other friends they can't look objectively at this problem without a relationship or two of unconditional love around him question number 6 how do they begin masha practices setting limits with supportive friends she realizes that she will still have friendships in which each friend carries her own weight if she and tammy break off their friendship question number 7 how do they set boundaries masha tells tammy about her feelings and informs her that she will need to take equal responsibility for their friendship in the future in other words after masha calls she won't call again until or unless tammy does masha hopes that tammy will miss her and begin calling If worse comes to worst and the friendship atrophies due to Tammy's unresponsiveness, Masha has gained something. She is she has learned it wasn't a mutual connection in the first place. Now she can grieve, get over it and move on to find real friends. Question number 8, what happens next? The mini crisis changes the character of the friendship permanently. It either exposes it for a non-relationship or it provides soil for rebuilding of a better one. Questions about friendship boundary conflicts. Boundary conflicts in friendship are difficult to deal with because the only cord tying the relationship together is the attachment itself. There is no wedding ring, there is no job connection, there is just a friendship and it often seems all too fragile and in danger of being severed people who are in the above conflicts often raise the following questions when they consider setting boundaries on their friendships 
Question number one. Aren't friendships easily broken? Most friendships have no external commitment such as marriage, work or church to keep friends together. The phone could just stop ringing and the relationship die with no real ripples in the love or in the lives of the participants. So, aren't friendships at greater risk of breaking up when boundary conflicts arise? This type of thinking has two problems. First, it assumes that external institutions such as marriage, work and church are the glue that holds relationships together. It assumes that our commitments are what hold us together, not our attachments. Biblically and practically, nothing could be further from the truth. We hear this thinking in many Christian circles. If you don't like someone, act like you do or make yourself love them or commit to loving someone or choose to love someone and the feelings will come. Choice and commitment are elements of a good friendship. We need or we, we do more than feather, fair weather friends. However, scripture teaches us that we cannot depend on commitment or sheer willpower for they will always let us down. Paul cried out that he did what he didn't want to do and he didn't do what he wanted to do. He was stuck. We all experience the same conflict. Even when we commit to a loving friendship, bad things happen. We let them down. Feelings go sore. Simply white knuckling, it won't re-establish the relationship. We can solve our dilemma the same way Paul solved his. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The answer is being in Christ Jesus. In other words, in relationship with Christ, both vertically and horizontally. As we stay connected to God, to our friends and to our support groups, we are filled up with the grace to hang in there and fight out the boundary conflicts that arise. Without this external source of connection, we are doomed to an empty willpower that ultimately fails or makes us think we are omnipotent. Again, the Bible teaches us that all commitment is based on a loving friendship. Being loved leads to commitments and willful decision making, not the reverse. How does this apply to friendship? Look at it this way. How would you feel if your best buddy approached you and said, I just wanted to tell you that the only person or sorry, the only reason we are friends is because I'm committed to our friendship. There's nothing that draws me to you. I don't particularly enjoy your company, but I will keep choosing to be your friend. You probably wouldn't feel very safe or cherished in this relationship. You would suspect you were being befriended out of obligation, not out of love. Don't let anyone fool you. All friendships need to be based on attachment or they have a shaky foundation. The second problem with thinking that friendships are weaker than institutionalized relationships such as marriage, church and work is in assuming that those three aren't attachment based. It simply isn't true. If it were, wedding vows would ensure a 0% divorce rate. Professions of faith would ensure faithful church attendance. A hiring would ensure 100% attendance at work. These three important institutions, so crucial to our lives, are to a large degree attachment based. It's scary to realize that the only thing holding our friends to us isn't our performance or our lovability or their guilt or their obligation. The only thing that will keep them calling, spending time with us and putting up with us is love. And that's the one we can't control. At any moment, any person can walk away from a friendship. However, as we enter more and more into an attachment-based life, we learn to trust love. We learn that the bonds of a true friendship are not easily broken. And we learn that in a good relationship, we can set limits that will strengthen, not injure the connection. Question 2. How can I set boundaries in romantic friendships? Single Christians have tremendous struggles with learning to be truth-tellers and limit-setters in romantic dating friendships. 
Most of the conflicts revolve around the fear of losing the relationship. A client may say, there's someone in my life whom I like a lot, but I am afraid if I say no to him, I'll never see him again. A couple of unique principles operate in the romantic sphere. One, romantic relationships are by nature risky. Many singles who have not developed good attachments with other people and who have not had their boundaries respected try to learn the rules of biblical friendships by dating. They hope that the safety of these relationships would help them learn to love, be loved and set limits. Quite often these individuals come out of a few months of dating more injured than when they went in. They may feel let down, put down or used. This is not a dating problem, it's a problem in understanding the purpose of dating. The purpose of dating is to practice and experiment. The end goal of dating is generally to decide sooner or later whether or not to marry. Dating is a means to find out what kind of person we complement and with whom we are spiritually and emotionally compatible. It's a training ground for marriage. This fact causes a built-in conflict. When we date, we have the freedom to say at any time, this isn't working out and to end the relationship. The other person has the same freedom. What does this mean for the person whose boundaries have been injured? Often, she brings immature, undeveloped aspects of her character to an adult romantic situation. In an arena of low commitment and high risk, she seeks the safety, bonding and consistency that her owns need. She entrusts herself too quickly to someone whom she's dating because her needs are so intense and she will be devastated when things don't work out. This is like, this is a little like sending a three-year-old to the front lines of battle. Dating is a way for adults to find out about each other's suitability for marriage. It's not a place for young, injured souls to find healing. This healing can best be found in non-romantic arenas such as support groups, church groups, therapy and same-sex fr same friendships. We need to keep separate the purposes of romantic and non-romantic friendships. It is best to learn the skill of setting boundaries in these non-romantic arenas where the attachments and commitments are greater. Once we have learned to recognize, set and keep our biblical boundaries, we can use them on the adult playground called dating. 2. Setting limits and romance is necessary. Individuals with mature boundaries sometimes suspend them in the initial stages of a dating relationship in order to please the other person. However, truth telling in romance helps define the relationship. It helps each person to know where he starts and the other person stops. Ignorance of one another's boundaries is one of the most blatant red flags of the poor health of a dating relationship. We will ask a couple in premarital counseling, where do you disagree, where do you lock horns? When the answer is, it's just amazing we are so compatible, we have very few differences, we'll give the couple homework, find out what you have been lying about to each other. If the relationship has any hope, that assignment will generally help. Question 3. What if my closest friends are my family? Boundary developing, in, developing individuals sometimes say, but my mother or father or sister or brother is my best friend. They often feel fortunate that in these times of family stress, the best friends are the family in which they were raised. They don't think they need an intimate circle of friends besides their own parents and siblings. They misunderstand the biblical function of the family. God intended the family to be an incubator in which we grow the maturity, tools and abilities we need. Once the incubator has done its job, then it's supposed to encourage the young adult to leave the nest and connect to the outside world to establish a spiritual and emotional family system on one's own. The adult is free to do whatever God has designed for him or her. Over time, we are to accomplish God's purposes of spreading His love to the world to make disciples of all the nations. 
Staying emotionally locked into the family of origin frustrates this purpose. It's hard to see how we'll change the world when we have to live on the same street. No one can become a truly biblical adult without setting some limits, leaving home and cleaving somewhere else. Otherwise, we never know if we have forged our or forged our own values, beliefs and convictions, our very identity or if we are mimicking the ideas of our family. Can family be friends? Absolutely. But if you have never questioned, set boundaries or experienced conflict with your family members, you may not have an adult-to-adult -adult connection with your family. If you have no other best friends than your family, you need to take a close look at those relationships. You may be afraid of separating and individuating of becoming an autonomous adult. Question 4. How can I set limits with needy friends? I was talking to a woman one day in a session who felt extremely isolated and out of control. Setting limits with her friends seemed impossible for her. They were in perpetual crisis. I asked her to describe the quality of her relationships. Oh, I have got lots of friends. I volunteer at the church two nights a week. I teach a Bible study once a week. I am on a couple of church committees and I sing in the choir. I am getting exhausted just listening to you describe your week, I said. But what about the quality of these relationships? They are great. People are being helped. They are growing in their faith and troubled marriages are getting healed. You know, I said, I am asking you about friendships and you are answering about ministries. They are not the same thing. She had never considered the difference. Her concept of friendship was to find people with needs and throw herself into a relationship with them. She did not know how to ask for things for herself. And that was the source of her boundary conflicts. Without these ministry relationships, this woman would have nothing. So she could not say no. Saying no would have plummeted her into isolation, which would have been intolerable. But it had happened anyway. She had come for help because of burnout. When the Bible tells us to comfort with the comfort with which we are confronted, it's telling us something. We need to be comforted before we can comfort. That may mean setting boundaries on our ministries so that we can be nurtured by our friends. We must distinguish between the two. A prayerful look at your friendships will determine whether you need to begin building boundaries with some of your friends. By setting boundaries, you may save some important ones from declining. And when romantic, dating relationships lead to marriage and you will still need to remember how to build and maintain boundaries even in this most intimate of human relationships. Okay y'all, let's end up for today. In the coming sessions, we'll try to understand what the authors talks about the boundaries between you and your spouse. Thank you for continuously listening to our recordings. Have a wonderful day.